Mm-hmm. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, coming to this lecture. My name is Yongho Park, and I'm a debater from South Korea. Um, and I will be delivering a lecture on NGOs and civil organizations. Um, I will. I'm planning to uh, like um, have this lecture for um, between 40 to 50 minutes, and maybe like open the floor and, and see if there are any questions. Um, yeah. So I will start. Um, before moving on to the actual part of the lecture, I just want to briefly talk about um, my experience with NGOs and civil organizations. So currently, I'm working as a project manager in a Korea-based NGO named Human Asia. Um, and what we do is we do a lot of initiative in Asian countries that aim to like advance the human rights condition. Um, and I'm also volunteering as a translator in Seoul Queer Culture Festival Department of Operations and Support. Um, so this is the sort of the organizing committee for these um, like Korean Pride uh, event. Um, and I'm basically doing a volunteer work here. And other than that, my past experiences were mainly like um, more like a volunteer work or I was recruited for a given period of time for a specific project or for a specific um, uh, like occasions. Um, but for the two uh, roles that I'm currently taking on, uh, I am a standing staff in both these institutions. Uh, and most of my experiences, in fact, if you look at it, are either local or international NGOs. Um, and most of the works are related to the international level of initiatives. So what that means is that um, a lot of the work that I have been a part of isn't necessarily things that happen on a local level, but it um, has a lot to do with partnering with other countries, organizations, or um, engaging with these uh, conditions of um, like other countries than Korea. So um, what I will be discussing in this uh, throughout this lecture will be more relevant with um, those kind of background that I personally have. So it might not necessarily be uh, like the most uh, uh, like relevant when we're discussing on the local NGOs, but I think a lot of things can overlap as well. I just wanted to put it out there for you, you to understand like where I come from and um, to what context will my materials be relevant. All right, so on um, the table of content of this lecture will be as follows. So I'll first give you the definition of NGOs and civil organizations, how to understand them. Second, I will talk a little bit about how do NGOs and civil organizations operate, and I will address like some common misconceptions that um, related to the NGOs and civil organizations. And lastly, I'll do some motion analysis about um, like the civil societies and things like that. So moving on to firstly, um, how should we define NGO? So in fact, NGO and civil organization is a very broad terminology. So I actually looked up on dictionary as to how NGO is being defined. And the literal definition is that like non-government organizations are those that are founded by individual citizens or private entities um, without any form of government intervention, which I think is a, I mean, it's not a wrong definition, but I'd say that it's a very generic um, way that you are, can understand NGOs and civil organization. So I added a couple of other layers of the characterizations that I think are quite necessary. So the first thing is that a lot of the NGOs, um, so. I think that the first thing that I need to resolve is what's the difference between civil organization and non-government organization? Um, and I think that the definition sort of differs um, according to the context or according to countries. But in Korea, these two um, terminologies are pretty interchangeable, but it, it's only different in like uh, according to in what context is this wording being used. So if it's local, um, it if it's uh, used in the local setting, then uh, these organizations or these types of organizations are referred as civil organization. So when Korean government, Korean government is referring to these organizations that are based in Korea, they use the wording civil organization. But non-government organizations are things that are, are the terminology that is more often used in the international setting, um, either referring to these organizations in other countries or international organizations referring to these grass organization. So um, I think if you look in depth, there are some level of differences, but in debate setting, at least I think that these are very interchangeable um, wordings, and it's pretty much similar. And the only difference that I think is the most relevant is 
um, in what context is this wording being used? Um, so with that out of the way, I, the next thing that I think is also important is that a lot of these NGOs and civil organizations are nonprofit in nature. Um, and what it means to be nonprofit is that they do not earn money directly from the um, from the project or target group. So what this means, um, and I think that nonprofit oftentimes is misunderstood as this which people working in NGOs don't earn any money, or people who are working in civil organizations are doing free labor, which is not really the case because um, we get monthly salaries, we do have our own wages. Um, but the thing about nonprofit is that um, the way that is different from like let's say private companies or private corporations is that when private corporations produce their goods or services um they charge certain fees um and the consideration is basically how do we maximize the amount of mar like the margin of the revenue that we're able to get or how do we maximize the profit basically in order for us to like get more economic benefit um, that's not the consideration when it comes to NGOs and civil organization, which is why a lot of their projects are free of charge or they're very low price, right? So when we are doing things like, for example, providing education for um, students, uh, we don't charge tuition fee or the tuition fee is very low oftentimes because it's funded by other entities like government or corporations and things like that. So that's what it means to be nonprofit. And I'll, and I'll elaborate on this point later on as well. Um, the ways that fun the ways that NGOs and civil organizations function is that a lot of their projects are focused on causes related to improving the con social conditions for selected group of people. And these selected group group of people tend to be um those that are marginalized or those that are disenfranchised that oftentimes do not have access to the social welfare or infrastructure services. Um, for example, students who cannot attend to attend schools and who cannot access to education. Or elderly, for instance, who after their retirement um, cannot access to other social services due to them um, not being economically productive to some extent, or um, oftentimes them having a very hard time into like um, in regards to their economic conditions for the fact that they do not earn any income anymore and things like that. Um, and these selected group of people are um, oftentimes referred to as the beneficiaries. And I'll be using the word beneficiaries for the sake of the clarity and the convenience um, throughout my lecture as well. Um, so, but some organizations tend to focus more on strengthening civil societies um, in general. So what this means is the, the former thing that I mentioned is more related to directly providing necessities and services for the disenfranchised individuals. But when it comes to strengthening civil society, it's more related to things like changing the norms. This looks like, for example, doing campaigns to raise the awareness, or for example, doing certain initiatives for the college students to be able to raise like the um, recognition that these issues are important and things like that. Uh, so oftentimes this looks like some organizations doing things like um, essay contests or um, like I don't know, like uh, thesis competition that is related to things like human rights or um, climate change and things like that. And I think in that regard, to some extent, debate organization can be recognized as civil organization or do have some overlapping functions with civil organization for the fact that oftentimes debate like institutions do things like um, women and gender minority initiative or they do things like um, like human rights related like debate competition they have like or lecture series where they exclusively talk about minorities and human rights and whatnot so i think that in that regards debate organizations some of them do function similar um or do fulfill similar function to these kind of ngos and civil organization lastly in regards to the personnel as to like people who work in this or these organizations um, and, and I think that this applies to Korea, and this might be a little bit different according to the context, but in Korea, individuals who work at or are involved in with these organizations are recognized as activists. So what that means is that if you work in an NGO, you're officially recognized by your government that you are an activist. Um, but as you already saw, my job title is not an activist, it's a project manager. And I think that the reason why um, a lot of organizations don't explicitly use the word activist is because oftentimes um, I think this also applies to the debate setting as well, because when we think when we talk about activists or activism, we oftentimes think of things that are political, 
more often than not, we imagine things like um, these people being very unsatisfied with the government and do things like protests and rallies and things like that. Some NGOs do that. And um, I told you that I also work as a translator in Seoul Pride. Um, and we do protest as well um, in the instances where we need to get certain permissions from the government and things like that. Um, but some NGOs who um, tend to refrain from being explicitly political for the fact that um, a lot of political organizations, um, their support for the, from the government do fluctuate according to the election results or who the incumbent party is and their political leaning. So a lot of um, NGOs or civil organizations who refrain themselves from being political or who try to frame themselves as apolitical tend to not use the wording activist, but rather use other things like project manager or um, program officer or assistant, basically the job titles that um, private companies also use just to like kind of um, preempt the kind uh, preempt the misconceptions that might be imposed on them. So I think that these are the ways in which perhaps we can um, more concretely define NGOs and civil organizations. All right. <clears throat> so moving on to the second issue as to how NGOs operate, and this is going to be sort of like the mechanism part of the debate, because um, when you're debating about NGOs, like you have to prove the, the ways in which NGOs can create change, um, how they operate and things like that. So this part will cover the mechanism part. All right, so how do they operate then? Um, and I said that I will address like some common misconceptions about NGOs. So the first misconception is that um, I, when I do business meeting with other like other organizations like or especially private companies because uh, we need to do things like joint projects or we need to talk about things like like corporate sponsorships and whatnot. So when we do meetings, a lot of these people say, tell me or tell the workers in my NGO that, like, oh, you must be a really altruistic person or, oh, I like respect your like goodwill or whatnot. Um, I think that uh, as much as it is true that uh, these people do have some level of good causes and things like that, it's not always the case that they are purely doing that for the altruistic um, purpose. Because I think a lot of the times um, what I have seen, especially when it comes to NGOs that work on an international level, a lot of people work in NGOs as a preliminary career experience so that they can advance into international organizations later on in their career prospects, like, um, you know, like uh, UNHCR or um, like, I don't know, like World Bank and like organizations as such. Um, or sometimes because like, especially if you're a big NGO, like Amnesty International, they do have their own financial team. They do have their own PR team and media team. So you might be someone who specializes in accountancy, but then happen to work in these NGOs. Um, and I think that this is important because um, insofar as these organizations are not purely altruistic and there are other incentives that the employees do have, this means that um, we, even within NGOs, this is why they don't work as a free labor. NGOs have to provide wages and reasonable amount of salaries for their workers. Um, and there do take place things like negotiations for um, like, you know, like uh, increasing the wages and things like that. Um, so it, the, op the way in which it op this operates is pretty similar to like just overall like private companies as well. I think the second common misconception that oftentimes exists, and I think this is more um, important in regards to the debate material, is that a lot of people think that NGOs are free from government control or they operate by grassroots donation. And what I mean by grassroots donation is donation that is being provided by um, ordinary citizens on the ground. Um, oftentimes, that's not the case. Um, there might be some or NGOs that are able to rely on these grassroots donation for the fact that, um, especially those NGOs that have a lot of publicity and they that have a lot of rep, like huge reputation, they tend to attract a lot of donations from grassroots ordinary citizens. But if you are a small NGO that do not necessarily have that much of a, of a um, publicity, it's very hard for you to aggregate enough amount of grassroots donation for you to do a huge project. Um, in which case, there are three ways in which NGOs secure the assets. The first is um, through an individual donation, especially from upper class individuals. And this is not necessarily like the grassroots donation for the fact that a lot of upper class individuals tend to donate huge amount of money 
Um, and the incentive as to why these people donate then is um, it might be because they have an altruistic causes that they want to support for children's rights or they want to support for gender equality. But I think that more relevant and perhaps more powerful incentive is that a lot of these rich people um, receive things like tax reimbursement when they make donations. So when they make donations, what happens is that the government issues, uh, not the government, sorry, NGOs and civil organizations issue them with things like um, the invoice of their donation that proves that this person has made what amount of donation. And if that person then um, submits that invoice to the government, then you are able to get tax reimbursement of which the amount is uh, like corresponding to the amount of donation that you have made. So I think that the incentive or the mentality here is basically that um, if you are a rich person who is going to be taxed anyways, a lot of the times people might feel like might as well use this money to support for altruistic causes. Or um, a lot of the times taxes, you're not able to transparently trace where your money is being used or to what extent of an impact are you creating with the tax that you're um, paying to the government. And if it is true that a lot of and like small NGOs are the ones that get huge amount of donation from upper class individual, these people then are able to clearly see like how their monies are being used and the impact that it is able to create at the end of the day. So um, NGOs do rely on individual donations, but contrary to the popular belief, it's more like the huge donations from certain rich people rather than grassroots donations. The second is the corp. Um, they do rely on corporations um, by direct funding or donation of supplies. So starting first with the donation of supplies, um, oftentimes corporations do provide NGOs and civil organizations with supplies like clothes or medicines. Um, and the reason why they have an incentive to do that is pretty much similar to why individuals donate to NGOs and civil organizations. Perhaps corporations do have their own altruistic causes, but they also do get tax reimbursement if they make funding or donate supplies. Um, or sometimes, especially when it comes to donation of supplies, if they have an unsold stock in their like storage and they have to get rid of these things, um, they oftentimes just uh, donate the amount to NGOs and NGOs can distribute the supplies to the beneficiaries. Um, and the direct funding is basically uh, some huge, especially like multinational corporations have their own charity foundations or um, scholarship foundations and things like that. For example, like the Rockefeller Foundation or um, the Open Society Foundation or Samsung Foundation, uh, they have certain like huge amount of budget that they allocate specifically to fund the uh, philanthropic projects that are initiated by the NGOs or civil organization. Um, and the way in which these corporations decide which project to support for oftentimes are de like decided after things like um, receiving grant proposals from NGOs. And then when they re when corporations review these proposals, they choose those projects that they think are more, more most prospective or oftentimes that like matches their vision the most and things like that. So um, yeah, that's one of the ways in which NGOs can secure assets. The last is through government funding. Um, and I wrote here COICA in Korea. So what COICA stands for is Korean and International Cooperation Agency. Um, and what they do is that um, a lot of NGOs in Korea that do things like foreign development assistance or that tries to support the um, development or try to implement certain philanthropic projects in other countries um, receive huge amount of funding from COICA. And quite a significant proportion of the NGOs actually do get funding from COICA. Um, and the way COICA then uh, like, I don't know, decides which projects to fund is same with corporations. They receive grant proposals or project proposals, and then they decide which project that they wish to fund. In which case, it's not really true that NGOs are truly like independent from the government. They, um, a lot of the times, they do also rely on government funding. Uh, especially in Korea, that is very much the case. I heard that it's not really, um, I think that it, I heard that it, in countries like Japan, they tend to be uh, like the NGOs and civil organizations tend to be uh, more autonomous from the government. So this depends on the context and the country that is um, being debated or that you want to address in the debate. Um, but 
like the bottom line clarification is that it's not true that all NGOs are free from government. And in fact, a lot of NGOs do rely on government funding for that matter. All right. So the next thing is how do NGOs and civil organizations create change with the uh, like capital and resources that they have secured? I think there are mainly six ways in which they do that. Firstly, they can directly lobby and influence the decision makers through financial leverage. Um, this is more relevant in the context of local NG local civil or civil organizations with their with their local or national government. Um, the second is through things like advocacy. So they spread information and ideas related to social and political issues and create um, political will or change the mentality of decision makers. Um, like for example, um, and the common, I guess, uh, example of this could be things like social movements that try to raise the awareness um, and push for legislative changes like um, legalizing same-sex marriage in some instances or legalizing abortion um, and things like that. Um, these are things that are more related to things like campaigning or things like um, raising the awareness to things like social media. Uh, and I've seen a lot of like um, international level of NGOs using social media to reach out to more broader pool of um, people, especially younger generation, to make them be more aware of the issues that they wish to tackle. Um, the third is like protest, which is explicit physical mechanism of showing the discontent. Um, and I told you that um, there are some NGOs that are more clear of their political leaning. They tend to adopt protests a little bit more often. Um, the fourth and fifth, I think, um, applies to a more bigger like or larger scale of NGOs, which is monitoring. Um, so a lot of like um, some some NGOs like Amnesty International um, have periodic re reports that they publish and they function as a watchdog role. So they um, monitor like certain governments and how they are doing with, for example, um, their, uh, whether or not they're adhering to the due diligence criteria um, provided by OECD or sometimes things like, um, what are the status of uh, the climate change and environmental destruction that these governments are like being complicit of and things like that. Oftentimes this watchdog role can apply to private corporations as well in some instances. Um, this looks like, for example, also like in some developing countries where there are development induced displacement, a lot of these um, NGOs do monitor these status and try to publicize these issues to raise the awareness. Um, so monitoring is, in that regards, very much related to the advocacy as well. But I think monitoring is more directly engaging with these governments and trying to say that um, when we assess your um, like when we assess your country, we uh, identify that um, these things are lacking and things like that. Um, the fifth is participation. So a lot of um, international organizations or huge scale um, NGOs. Uh, become formally part of the policy arrangement as a relevant stakeholder or even as a co-decision cool maker. Um, so like, I think for instance, if you look at United Nations um, Universal Periodic Review, like although UN is not necessarily like non-government organization per se, but um, they do uh, recommend countries in regards to what they should improve in regards to their um, human rights condition, um, what kind of laws that they should implement or which type of stakeholder that deserves the most amount of attention by these governments. Um, or um, a lot of, or, or in some cases, governments do um, recruit these NGOs and civil organizations for like consultancy position while the decision-making process. So a lot of these experts are able to give recommendations to the government so that they are able to implement and adopt those kind of recommendations. Um, and I think that uh, the best or um, one of the ways in which this participation happens is, for example, some NGOs give recommendations to government in regards to the uh, labor condition, and then the government can um, accept certain recommendations and uh, implement those suggestions to the public enterprises. So basically the government agencies or government run corporation um, and then then and then that particular like norm can spread to private and like domain as well. Um, that's one of the ways in which NGOs also create change, change through participation. The last is these organizations also provide services. Um, so for example, um, organizations like Medicines Without Borders or Compassion International, 
they directly go to these vulnerable areas or sites. They provide things like medical services and medical supplies. Um, they oftentimes directly provide things like education. Um, and how they like secure funding is all um is by all the mechanisms that I previously laid out. Um, so these are the ways in which NGOs create change at the end of the day in um uh, through all the mechanisms, there might be more, but I think these six are the most common ways in which organizations do that. Um, so on to some discussion on points that I think needs to be discussed, right? Um, which I think are very controversial in some instances, and also um, perhaps might be an interesting food for thought if you're making motions. <laughs> um, so uh, the points for discussion is first the how close should NGOs and civil organizations be with their own government? Because like I said, NGOs are not fully independent from government. Oftentimes they do rely on government funding. In which case, is that really a good thing or not? Um, I think because, and this is crucial because NGOs and civil organizations or by and large civil society are oftentimes believed to be filling in the gaps created by government policy. Um, and in which case, if it is true that civil society or civil organization um, tend to cater to the interests that are oftentimes neglected by the government, then if these organizations are get closer to the government, to what extent then civil organization be able to like fulfill that role of like, you know, trying to uh, like make up for the deficiencies of the government? I think that the crucial question that you need to ask at this point then is, um, to what extent does the government have an incentive to care for those issues at the end of the day? Because even if the government might not be prioritizing that issue or prioritizing that cause, doesn't automatically mean that the government has absolutely no incentive to care for that. Because oftentimes governments also operate on scarce resources and limited capital. Um, so they do have to make a trade-off oftentimes. So if your government is like prioritizing, prioritizing things like rapid economic development, oftentimes they tend, tend to end up like deprioritizing things like environment, or they oftentimes deprioritize things like social equitability and things like that. But that doesn't mean that these governments have no incentive to care for that, right? Um, or they might be just um, like complacent or like unaware and ignore of, ignorant of these issues as well. In which case, like, I, and I think that this applies when it comes to things like the issue of environment, because a lot of governments do acknowledge that fact that in like the climate change is very detrimental and a lot of countries in fact have been recently um committing to things like carbon neutrality by 2040 or 2050 and whatnot um a lot of countries have the recognition of sustainable development goals and things like that but i think that the reason why government governments despite those commitments end up not being able to achieve them is not because they are always evil but oftentimes because of, again, like things like scarce resources and whatnot, in which case, if NGOs are able to fill in that gap, I think to some extent, governments might be welcoming those kind of NGOs. Because the example that I think I can think of is, um, in the case of Korea, there's a general concession on the fact that um, like education should be universal and um, the access to education is a very on basic rights that people should have, right? Especially like primary and secondary education and to some extent tertiary education as well. In which case, if the government cannot possibly care for everyone and provide education for everyone, oftentimes governments do welcome NGO initiatives or civil organization initiatives to provide education for those people who cannot access to private or public education. So in that case, these NGOs might be able to create a good relationship with the government, but still able to, to some extent, like um, achieve their end goal or create meaningful changes at the end of the day. But I think that if the issue is, for example, the causes and topics that your government is not always like welcoming, or like for example, um, like the issue of queer rights in Korea, or um the rights of indigenous people or ethnic minorities in some ethnically or racially diverse countries or um, like religious minorities and whatnot, oftentimes governments don't have a huge incentive, not only not have a huge incentive, but oftentimes governments um, have a bad relationship with these communities. Um, and 
therefore, if NGO wants to cater to these people's needs, oftentimes governments might not necessarily be welcoming of them because governments oftentimes are supported by certain ethnic majority or religious majority and whatnot. In which case, if you are an NGO that wants to cater to these um, groups interest, it's not always the best for you to be close with um, government oftentimes, right? Um, or if you are close with government, then there will probably exist a threshold in terms of the extent to which you can fully um, cater the interests of these um, groups of individuals. So I think um, I think the question of um, how close should NGOs and civil organizations with uh, should be with the government is highly dependent on what causes these organizations are in fact trying to foster um, and to what extent um, do the government have an incentive to cooperate in regards to these initiatives and projects. Um, the second question or second discussion point, um, I think this also nicely extends on this, the first issue as well, which entities better between government and corporations? Because I think like if it is true that um, some causes are not likely to be supported by the government, um, in which case these NGOs or organizations might depend on corporations, then the question that needs to be asked is, is corporation really a better entity necessarily in comparison to government? Because to be fair, in debates, both um, entities tend to get criticized uh, as like um, as well. Um, in which case, I think that, and also often corporations are all under the influence of the government for the fact that corporations also rely on fiscal policies that governments implement, or for example, um, like tax exemption breaks that these um, core governments provide for these um, corporations. So just because they rely on corporation doesn't mean that they are entirely free from government um, influence. They might be still indirectly um, influenced by the government more or less. Um, I think uh, the very common argument that I see between in, in the debates between governments and corporations is the idea that governments, um, you can hold governments accountable, but you cannot hold corporations accountable, right? Um, but I think that it's very um, reasonable to ask the question as to whether or not that is true in the context of civil organizations and NGOs, because the mechanisms by which debaters um, prove the government accountability is oftentimes through things like democratic voting. So if governments um, fail, then people vote out that government or vote out that party or vote out that politician. But I think that not, I, I'm not like, I think that uh, the election results aren't really decided based on which NGO did the government support and what did this NGO do? Did their initiative fail or succeed? I, I think that that's a very, um, that's not something that is at the center of these considerations during the election, in which case I think that the gen generic argument of like you can hold the government accountable is to some extent questionable in the dynamics of NGOs and civil organization, whether their failures can be attributed to the government to the extent that you can vote out the politicians. Do voters have an incentive to care for that to that much of an extent? I think it's up to the discussion of the debate. Thirdly, then, um, <clears throat> where do we draw the line within the campaigns to attract funding? Because a lot of call-outs exist on certain contents created as, um, like created as like poverty pornography, um, that like certain videos or um images that portray a very graphic sufferings of the vulnerable people, oftentimes like young children being like really like starving, um, and then not being able to wear a proper clothes. Um, and a lot of like organizations showing these images and trying to arouse empathy to gain funding. Oftentimes there's like huge criticism in regards to how inhumane that is or how that um, does not respect the dignity of these vulnerable individuals. Um, but I think that like, even when it comes to things like slum tour, which is a lot of like tourist programs that some NGOs um, organize that you take certain, <clears throat> like mostly rich people to slum areas or ghettoized areas and show the vulnerable situation to arouse empathy and get funding. I think these are oftentimes very criticized as inhumane and that we should refrain from that. Um, but I think that at the same time, it's to some extent a very powerful means to shock these rich people and, and get funding or donation from them. For the fact that if you are rich, this probably means that you're not exposed to those vulnerable conditions. 
So showing that graphic images of that vulnerable condition oftentimes um, breaks the uh, comfort zone of these privileged elites and therefore that oftentimes how like the rationale or justification that these organizations give when they are portraying these graphic imageries and things like that. So I think this is very much up to debate in terms of the extent to which it can aggregate funding. I think oftentimes the arguments that can be used against these kind of um, campaigns is that uh, a lot of the times if you continuously expose people to the graphic images, they might get desensitized oftentimes, or oftentimes they might feel as if their donations or their contributions are um, not creating any meaningful change. Because if, if you are a donor or if you if you make donations, but if you're continuously exposed to the most graphic images, you're more likely to feel like my donation, in fact, is not really creating a meaningful change. So I think that um, those might be the arguments that you want to use against like uh, excessive portrayal of sufferings of these individuals. Lastly, then, um, how should the beneficiaries of the NGOs project be selected? So a lot of NGOs, in fact, do have some level of religious affinity, whether that be um, like uh, Islamic organizations or Catholic organizations. But I think that we can ask, um, to what extent are these uh, religious identity or characteristics of these organizations preferable? Because I've noticed that some, I, I wouldn't be specific in terms of which country, but I noticed that in some countries where uh, Islam is the majority religion, some Catholic NGOs do scholarship, uh, do provide for scholarship funding in order to help the vulnerable students um, afford university education, but um, they have that um, application eligibility for the scholarship contingent on if you convert from Islam to Catholic. So if you convert your religion, we will give you that funding. Um, in which case, I think that's very reasonably uh, criticizable for the fact that like oftentimes um, the idea of human rights is supposed to be universal, but if you're making that contingent on the religion, is that universal or is that fulfilling to the like general principle of human rights? Um, oftentimes you can very ask um, a very practical question. So if this person has converted in a converted to a different religion in a Islam majority community, and if it is also the case where that country is conservative, um, this means that you're more likely to be uh, further like marginalized or disenfranchised for the fact that you have converted your religion, you're more likely to be seen as a traitor and you're likely to be excommunicated, excommunicated by your family, friends and um, your social circle and whatnot, the point where you have like explicitly like converted in order to get scholarship. In which case, if that person, even if got a university degree, to what extent can they meaningfully assimilate to the mainstream society is also up to question. Um, but I think that these are relatively under discussed areas in the um, civil organization and civil society. So I think that this um, is worth of discussing at the end of the day. All right, so um, with that said, I'll move on to the last part on some motion analysis. Uh, so the first motion that I wanted to discuss about civil organization and NGOs is, this house believes that NGOs in developing countries should prioritize advocacy for changing institutional norms, e.g. Transparency, democracy over advocacy for tangible goods, e.g. building water systems, raising incomes by set amounts and whatnot. So this is basically about like, you know, whether the NGO should be political or not, or which one is more preferable. Um, I think that, so if I were to discuss on the cases that you can make on Gov or Op, I think in Gov, you can lay out the premise that changing institutional norms are likely to create larger scope of change for the fact that if you do think if you only focus on advocacy for tangible goods, this means that the areas or villages that you build water system are the only beneficiaries of that project or initiative. Whereas you're able if you're able to create a norm um, regarding the national government, then that change is more likely to trickle down to a larger scope of individuals. Um, I think that it's very intuitive as to what the benefit of changing the institutional norms is, which I think is the reason why more burden of proof falls on the mechanism by which you do that. Um, I just talked about how like NGOs can give political consultancies to government or provide suggestions to improve gender equality index and whatnot. Um, oftentimes you're able, especially um, you're able to receive fundings from Western institutions and exert influence on in international organization when you focus on institutional norms, because I heard that um, some like uh, like foundations that 
support for these um like philanthropic projects in the developing countries like the united states foundation like for example NED, which I think stands for National Endowment for Democracy, they specifically say that all projects that are funded by them should have an end goal of strengthening democratic norm in that country. So I think that a lot of Western countries, especially United States, um, tend to focus a lot on those democratic norms. So if you're able to focus on institutional norms and you're able to get funding from these rich countries, right? So I think that's something that you can also say as a mechanism by which you're able to to, to prove how you secure that funding. And I think that this is also important in terms of the nuance because it says NGOs in developing countries. And I think they are oftentimes at the best position to engage with local or national government and create sustainable relationship. Because oftentimes if foreign organizations try to create this institutional norm and the, like foster democratic norms in these developing countries, the reaction from these developing countries are not that um good or hostile, which is why I think that the degree of that hostility is likely to decrease if it's local NGO and therefore there's some level of credibility or some level of like mutual trust that is going on. Um, I think that the question that Gulf has to answer to is will governments have an incentive to adopt? I already said uh, in the beginning of like or in the previous like slides, um, often governments are unaware or lack the political transparency has been normalized throughout time to the point where it's not always the case that governments are just explicitly corrupt and they want to maintain that st like status quo. But oftentimes governments are quite normalized with that status quo to the point in which they don't really feel that huge necessity. I mean, therefore, the additional push or um, notch from these NGOs and their engagement can still somewhat create um, some level of change. I think that... Um, Obviously, uh, what kind of institutional norms are you referring to? It's up for the debaters to define. Um, you can say that some institutional norms are not that like controversial. Like for example, things like the general idea of, about how children need to be uh, educated, or how schooling should be provided, or how healthcare is important. Um, and therefore, like governments should like focus on things like welfare. I think that these are things that perhaps Gough can say that these are the institutional norms that we wish to change, which are not that much controversial. Um, I think that you can also say that, that like the ad advocacy for changing institutional norms oftentimes will involve things like long-term projects like education, because for example, a lot of the ways in which you strengthen democratic norms is through the strengthening of education to teach the values of like freedom and liberty to students by these like educational curriculums and whatnot. So I think that when you focus on changing institutional norms, inevitably it becomes somewhat of a long term, and that I think is the bite that government team has to bite. Um, then in the opposition, what can you say? So if you're opposition, the premise is that pol political actions are by NGOs are unlikely to be endorsed by the state, especially if the government is corrupt or to some extent unlikely to receive the funding. Um, oftentimes because like the political transparency might not be something that you're like head of the state would necessarily prefer, or even if some leaders do like it, the elite circle within the government might not favor that particular change of an institutional norm, in which case you're unlikely to receive that funding from the government. Also, if it is all true that um, corporations are also under the influence of the government, if you try to become like political and become controversial, the corporations are also less likely to fund you, which means that you do not have enough leverage to be able to push for your initiative. Um, the mechanisms by which you can prove that it's um, firstly, as I've said, corporate foundations are close to national government. Secondly, people are less likely to buy into the narrative of changing institutional norm for the fact that it oftentimes sounds something that is a little bit distant away from them because if people on the ground need like supplies like water systems or if they need the raise of income, if they need hospitals, when NGOs come to them and campaign and say like, hey, we need to um, achieve transparency. Hey, we need to like achieve democracy. Um, it's more likely to be seen as either less important or important, but something that is far fetched and distant to the point where it's unlikely to get enough buy-in to create a huge political leverage um, to push the government and curb their behavior. I mean, I think thirdly, um, I also briefly mentioned this. If you are political the degree of support that you can get from the society is likely to fluctuate according to which party is the incumbent one at the moment. So a lot of long-term projects are unlikely to be sustained if there's constant fluctuation going on. 
Um, and NGOs can become also more elite or middle class centric when the goal is to change the institutional norms, because oftentimes that means that you have to understand what democracy is. And there's a favoring for those people who perhaps things like learned like tertiary education and political science and things like that. If the norm is to create that like democracy and for NGOs to lead that particular process of spreading and proliferating the democratic norms. Um, I think you can also say that tangible goods are tangible um good ten, sorry tangible goods create immediate changes that are needed, especially in the perspective of redistribution. So if you get money from governments or corporations that have a lot of money, um, building tangible goods are direct ways in which we can redistribute that capital in order to cater to the beneficiaries, like resilient housings in disaster-prone areas or close distribution to the vulnerable areas in countries with a low temperature during winter and things like that are the most visible and tangible way of redistribution. So in that regard, I think oftentimes this might be the most effective way in comparison to the long-term like changing of an institutional norm, which I think oftentimes is also contingent on like other factors as well, like your incumbent government, whether or not those people who are receiving that education have a will to further push for democratization or um, like uh, it, adoption of transparency in your politics and things like that. All right, so um, the next motion that I think uh, can be discussed is this house believes that individuals and NGOs in developed countries should focus their charitable effort on causes outside their borders rather than local causes. Um, and I think that this sort of like um, debate, like whether it be local or international, um, can happen in other like dynamics as well, whether like for instance, like medical R&D should focus on local or international issue and whatnot. Um, so the logic and the materials that can use for this motion can also be transferred to other motions that have a similar underwave, underwave dynamic. If you are a government, you can say that causes outside borders are more focused uh, like you can first establish that causes outside their borders are likely to be more focused on developing countries and global south for the fact that these are the context that has the most amount of urgency when it comes to these like um like uh, philanthropy causes or uh, like charitable efforts um and therefore it is more likely to be focused on these contexts which necessarily means that there's more level of urgency right um if you in comparison to that if you look at the developed countries a lot of local causes are dealt by government to some extent. Um, if it is the case that it's generally functioning democracy, this means that there's state welfare. There's still there's like private social enterprises that cater to these things and things like that. Um, so when it comes to the degree of urgency, you can argue that um, the causes outside the borders are more imminent. Um, and I think that you can also mechanize by saying that if all individuals and NGOs focus on causes outside their borders, and by the natural conclusion, the developing countries are more vulnerable areas, this means that more com competing bids and grant proposal for assisting um, more vulnerable countries will naturally take place, which means that if there are more competing bids and proposals, then those that end up getting funded are going to be those um, with a better quality project with over, um, better quality uh, project overall, which necessarily means that we're able to proportionally have that good quality in the most vulnerable area in comparison to wh when that good quality project is like allocated for the developed countries and their local causes. Um, I think that, uh, and especially when the motion says focus, because I think opposition might say things like, oh, but like developed countries also have their own necessities as well. I think what then golf can sort of preempt is I'm not sure if this um is something that operates in debate, but like in terms of like what will happen realistically is that if these NGOs or civil organizations fail to receive grants and funding, um they can then reallocate their resources for local causes. So if they don't get funding from uh like foundations for to do a and to do a uh healthcare projects in the developing country, then they can just like reallocate this to their local causes. And this sounds not necessarily very debate material-ish, but I think this is what will realistically happen in reality, if you really think of it, because like not all NGOs who aim to infiltrate into the context of developing countries end up succeeding in doing so. So I think that this is the 
like sort of preemption that you might be able to do. But the, the difference probably then is that like the projects that are going to take place in the developed world are probably going to be lower of a quality in comparison to what happens in the vulnerable countries, which then you can say that it's a good thing because like, you know, it's these countries that like it's these vulnerable countries that need the most extensive level of um like charitable effort, right? Um, on the other hand, if you're opposition, you can flip the vulnerability framing by saying that the degree of vulnerability and urgency should not be contingent on the place of residence. So if you're economically vulnerable, just because you live in Korea, which presumably is a developed country, doesn't mean that these people's needs are not urgent. Or oftentimes there are like refugees in Europe, right? But just because European countries are developed countries doesn't mean that these refugees are refugee like individuals or refugee communities are fine or they're getting enough support. So I think that if you're opposition, you can say these things and flip the vulnerability framing. Um, I think especially if the motion is about refugee, you can also say that the mechanism of being countries might overburden these countries for the fact that if all the focus is geared towards the developing countries, this means that developing countries are the major hub for refugee acceptance. But if it is true that these countries oftentimes don't have that much of a capital, or even aside from capital, there's limited space for these countries to host refugees and establish refugee camps. This presumably means that this is likely to overburden the developing countries, which is why the effort of charity should be like proportionally dis uh, distributed um, alongside the developing and the developed countries. Um, I think you can also say that individuals and NGOs generally have a better leverage when they are dealing with local causes, especially when you're small NGOs. Because if you're doing a project outside your border, you have to have a local or local partner organization. So if you are a Korean NGO that does, um, like, I don't know, like project in, let's say, Philippines, then you need a local organization in Philippines that partners with you so that you're able to do a project in the Philippines, right? which means that there's lack of direct engagement and accountability. There might be things like miscommunication. There might be things like time zone difference where it's very hard to coordinate things, right? And get things done quickly and whatnot. Um, oftentimes you can say that like things might get a little bit untransparent if there is a huge physical distance and language barrier and whatnot. Um, and I think that you can also say that um, yeah, so I think you can also say that if you focus only on the outside border, then the development assistance provided to foreign countries are subject to tariffs or government control. And what this means is that, for example, a lot of governments, uh, like national government or local government, tax and interfere with foreign NGOs and how they do projects. Oftentimes they, um, so for example, especially when it comes to things like, like providing supplies, when organizations are providing, let's say, like 100 um, jackets, like winter jackets or winter clothing, oftentimes there exists regulation. Like it's different according to the government, but some government require like 10% of that supply to be provided to the government. So the government can distribute to um, with their own like public project, right? Which necessarily means that um, things get hijacked or things might get like, um, like lost along the way to some extent. Um, and therefore the net less capital will be directly allocated for the beneficiaries at, at the end of the day. Um, so I think that you can reasonably say that, I mean, sure, like causes outside the borders and local causes are equally important, but the question then boils down to not about which causes are more important, but which causes is more likely to succeed. And I think that this framing or angle is quite important because when we debate about NGOs or when we debate about which infrastructural projects should we focus on? I think that debaters tend to focus a lot on what is more important or what can create better change or larger degree of change. But I think that there is a little bit lesser focus on whether or not it can succeed, right? So even like going back to the first motion, I think that the debate that I see more often than not tend to largely focus on whether or not institutional norm is important versus tangible good is more important. Or for example, things like what creates net like larger effect. But I think that debaters can reasonably ask the question of if NGO tries to change the institutional norm, 
how much will they be able to get support from the low, like for, from the grassroots as well as from the government and corporation? Um, will because I think that the success of that initiative also largely focuses on the traction that you're able to gain as an organization. So I think that these are definitely rooms that you're able to discuss. And I know that also like UADC is an AP debate, but if there are NGO debates in like British parliamentary, and if you're closing, and if opening only talks about like the general importance of like institutional norms or general importance of whatever end goal that they are trying to support for, I think you as a clothing team can reasonably shift the debate by saying that like, look, both things are important. Maybe what matters more is which side has a clearer feasibility for that to succeed or that particular value to be achieved at the end of the day, perhaps could be one strategy that you engage in these debates as well. All right, um, so that's it for uh, my uh, lecture. Um, oh yeah, and it's 58, so I think I might be able to get one question if there is there is any. So I'll just open the floor now. Um, and if there are no questions, I think like yeah, we can, yeah, end this session. But yeah, I will stop talking right now. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think if there's no question, um, I think this will be it for the lecture. Um, and thank you again for uh, attending this uh, session. And I hope you all the best result in the UADC and upcoming uh, like tournaments that will happen. Thank you.